Hi, I'm Jeff, and today we're going to talk about JavaScript modules. In this episode, we're going to learn about ES6 functions, declaring variables, and how modules are built, imported, and exported. To code along, pull down the Ruby Thursday example app with this branch, git clone dash b ruby snack 65 setup dash dash single branch, cd into Ruby Thursday, run bundle, then rails db create and db migrate. And then, since we have Webpack installed, run yarn to install all our JavaScript dependencies. Okay, let's take a look at a super simple JavaScript function, add. I'm pretty sure you could tell what it does, but if you're new to ES6, you might be thinking, hey, there are a few things in that function I don't understand. And if you're pretty experienced with modern JavaScript, you're probably thinking, three lines to add two numbers, that's cute. This is called a fat arrow function. And this is what it would look like in ES5. You're going to see functions written like this a lot in React, especially in stateless functional components, so I want to make sure you understand what's going on. First, let's talk about declaring our function with const. We have three ways of declaring variables, var, const, and let. The main difference between var and our new ways of declaring variables, const and let, is that var is scoped to the function, and const and let or block scoped. Take a look at this function. Side note, you shouldn't do this. It's for demonstration purposes only. We have a function, check if I need to wear a jacket, where we input the temperature. And if it's under 65, it'll tell you, yes, Jeff, you do need to wear a jacket today. So when the function is compiled by the browser, jacket weather, being function scoped, gets hoisted to the top and will look more like this which is probably how you should be writing it anyway, because it's good practice to declare a variable at the top of its scope. var is function scoped and will be available anywhere within the function. const and let are block scoped. This means they're scoped to the inside of the curly brackets. So when we go back to our earlier check if I need to wear a jacket function, if we change the var to let and try to run it, we get uncaught reference error, jacket weather is not defined because when jacket weather is declared within curly brackets, it does not get hoisted and is unavailable when we get to the return. Finally, what is the difference between const and let? Const is short for constant. It's immutable, meaning it can't be changed. But if it's an object, you can still add, remove, and modify properties on it. If it's a Boolean, a number, or a string, you can't change it. If you tried, you would get a syntax error saying, the identifier jacket weather has already been declared. So those are the cases where we use let. Boolean, strings, counters, iterators. Let is fantastic for for loops, by the way. Let's get back to our original function, add. Now we have to talk about the little equals greater than combo. In JavaScript, this is called a fat arrow, and we would call this a fat arrow function. There are two main benefits to fat arrow functions. One, they share the this keyword with its parent scope. So if you've ever had to write something like self equals this, you'll be happy to know that this will get passed right into the fat arrow function. And two, they're a lot smaller than function expressions. After the fat arrow, the return is implicit, so we can remove our curly brackets and condense our add function to one line like this. And check out what we can do with our old check if I need to wear a jacket function. If we only have one argument, we can drop the parens too. All right, now let's talk modules. For that, let's go to code. To get started, go to your terminal and open up two tabs. In one, run Rails S, and in the other, run bin webpack dev server. Let's check out the browser and make sure everything's working. Okay, we're gonna be working with the Kirk quote button. Click on it and we get a modal with beam me up Scotty. You can find the JavaScript with the event listeners for the button clicks in app assets JavaScript home.js. Notice that the modal is being revealed and hidden with custom fade in and fade out functions instead of the functions provided with jQuery. These functions are coming from a helpers.js file in the same directory. There are a few problems with this. First, our fade in and fade out functions are global, and we want to prevent polluting the global namespace as much as possible. You might suggest we do something like this, but helpers is still global and we can do better. And second, when we're here in our home.js file, we have no idea where fade in and fade out came from. To solve this, 
We're going to learn about modules by refactoring this helpers file and importing it into a new file with our event listeners. Let's make a new folder in app JavaScripts called helpers and then make two new files, one called fadein.js and one called fadeout. Now copy the contents of fadein into fadein and fadeout into fadeout. Quick side note, the little plus before L and new date is a unary operator, which indicates that we're doing math and tries to convert the element into a number. And delete the original. Next, let's copy the contents of home.js and put it in bundle.js, as that's our entry point. And now remove the two requires from application.js. Now we hit save. Go back to the browser and yep, doesn't work anymore. All right, let's refactor fadein.js. We'll start by converting it to a fat arrow function. ES6 also gives us default values and function arguments, so we can set the default value here. Next, we see that our variable last is modified every time the tick function is called, so we can change its declaration to let. And tick can be converted into another fat arrow function. Now we just have to export fade in, and to do that, we just write export default fade in at the bottom of the file. The process is exactly the same for fade out, so I'm not going to make you watch me do it. To import fade in and fade out, we write import fade in from, and here we have to link it to the file's location. So back one directory, that's what the first two dots mean, into the helpers folder, and fade in.js. Note assumes we're working with JavaScript files, so we don't have to include the .js. Now let's hit save and test it. Okay, great, it's working. Remember, we don't have to refresh because Webpack is doing it for us as soon as it's done compiling. Now, there's actually a better way to do this. It seems kind of weird that we split fade in and fade out into two files, right? Let's see how we can make this better. Let's copy the contents of fade out into fade in, remove the default exports, then export these functions directly on the lines they're declared on with export const fade in and export const fade out. This is called a named export, and you can have several per module, but only one default export. Then we'll change the name fade in to fades because we think it sounds cool. Back in bundle.js, we need to change the import statement. I'll paste this in here. Named imports are included by explicitly naming the functions you want to use inside curly brackets like this. Maybe you have 10 functions in your file and you only need these two. Well, this is how you would pull them out. Hit save and refresh. Still working. And there's still one more way to do this. Let's pretend you do need all 10 of those helper functions. Listing them all out can get kind of verbose, so we can change that import statement to import splat as helpers from dot dot slash helpers slash fades, and now we have access to all of them. We just have to change our function calls to helpers dot fade in and helpers dot fade out. So that should give you a pretty good overview of how modules work. They're the building blocks of modern JavaScript projects. When you keep your modules small and self-contained, it makes them really easy to maintain. They don't pollute the global scope, and they're super reusable, so you can share them throughout your code base and even bring them from one project to another, and that can save you a lot of time, which makes them awesome. Thanks so much, and in the next episode, we'll write some more JavaScript. That's it for this episode of Ruby Thursday. If you are not already on my mailing list, head on over to rubythursday.com to sign on up and check out older episodes if you're new. If you are not subscribed on YouTube, you can click that big ruby there to subscribe. And here are some other videos that you might be interested in. YouTube subscribers get the episodes just a little bit before everyone else. If you have any comments or questions, it's best to leave those on YouTube. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you soon.